say I did have audio problems at the very beginning of Nino's comments. I caught the later ones, so I'm kind of piecing together a little bit of what he said, but I think I got most of it and, and please pardon if I, I've missed pieces. But um, I also would recommend another book, um, the, the Sociopath Next Door, um, because there's a difference between a sociopath and a psychopath. Um, a sociopath has some type of weak conscience, not a strong conscience. A sociopath has technically no conscience whatsoever. They both don't feel remorse and they both have tremendously detrimental behaviors. And you tend to see sociopaths as well as psychopaths. There are more sociopaths, obviously, than psychopaths as a percentage of the population. But you tend to see both groups vastly over overrepresented in two places. And I bet you guys can guess where prisons and corporate boardrooms. Um, it is not a surprise. Um, but uh, I wanted to get to some of Nino's comments on surveillance. And specifically, um, he was saying that um, when, I, when I cut in, and I apologize if I didn't get the full extent of this comment, but you were saying that, for example, monitoring what programs computer programs a person is using wouldn't necessarily be surveillance, it would be, um, wouldn't necessarily be compliance. And actually, there's enormous mission creep in compliance, where all of a sudden, in order to say, look for insider trading issues, you are listening to everyone's phone calls, literally listening to their phone calls, and having computer audio um, analyzed uh, by AI that's listening to flags. You are also reading all their emails and having computer AI go through their emails. So that is an enormous vacuuming up of information. It's, it, it's a vastly unnecessary vacuuming up of information. And oh, you can talk to compliance officers and it's really interesting because sometimes the compliance officers are actually really uncomfortable with what's going on and they feel pressure to do that vast data collection which is way beyond what is necessary um, in order to feel as though they're doing their job, they're being responsive, they can speak to regulators, they can cover their rear ends, all of these other issues for the company. And it's become this vicious cycle where yes, all of that surveillance is now wrapped under compliance. So yes, you know, looking at what computer programs people are using is absolutely become core to compliance, even though I would argue with you that that should not be compliance, right? That, that, that there should be a rejection of the over uh, surveillance, of the overreach of the collection of data in this way. And yes, I do think that the GDPR, so I am a lawyer, um, and I can talk a little bit about some of, the, um, some of the legal standards about collecting information. And we are right at the edge. <laughs> in fact, we have surpassed them in Europe with the GDPR um, and there is this actually really interesting tension, especially in the financial sector, where regulators are, are pushing um, banks, especially, to collect enormous amounts of data on their employees and their employees' actions. And that is in direct conflict with the GDPR and the right to be forgotten. And so, uh, for example, under the GDPR, you would have to, which is the European privacy framework, um, a lot of that data has to be deleted after six years. And it's the financial regulators who are pushing the banks not to delete that data because if they wanna make some, they imagine, and by the way, as you talk to financial regulators and I talk to a lot of financial regulators and the New York Fed is getting, the New York Federal Reserve Bank is getting smarter and smarter about this. I've been talking to them a lot about reforming their policies and, and the fact that regulators are pushing a lot of this and actually pushing bad behavior, pushing um, the uh, unethical wrongdoing that, they're that they say they're trying to prevent. Um, the regulators are, are pushing the banks to collect that data and maintain that data and keep that data far past when an employee leaves. So if you think about it, um, if, if, for example, so I'm wearing a Fitbit, right? Um, it, I do data surveillance and data privacy, and I am very careful about where this Fitbit um, Bluetooth connection goes and who has access to that data. And I do not put it on a device that's accessible to my employer's network. Why? Because they could figure out off of my Fitbit and this is not me, me being paranoid. There are plenty of legal cases like this 
They can figure out my heart rate. They can figure out the, my temperature. They can figure out my the steps I've walked. They can figure out if I had sex last night and who I had sex with because they have my GPS location. So, and at, at, especially being female, they can figure out fertility cycles. And that is almost always used against employees. And frankly, as a lawyer, often what you want to counsel employers to do is not collect that information. Do not have that information on women's fertility cycles. Why? Because the moment a jury hears that, you are going to be liable for employment discrimination, right? There's a lot of stuff that they should not collect because you open the door to liability. And people really haven't talked about that and had that conversation, but they should. Also, um, I would just say that um, Nina was talking about the rise in misconduct. That's directly related to the rise in surveillance and the invasiveness of surveillance. And what you are seeing is a poisoning of the workplace. I'm gonna say some things that are a little controversial, surprise, surprise, but I think that this needs to be brought out, that, there, that a lot of modern management techniques come from a very dark place. So we know as a matter of the historical record, and this is well established, this is not my work, this is Katlyn Rosenthal, this is you know, Matthew Desmond, this is amazing researchers out there um, and, and historians largely, um, that the roots of modern management techniques are in the slave plantations of the US South and the West Indies. That's how you could figure out how to control people. That was the beginning of the task system that replaced the previous system for enslaved people, which was the gang system in which you worked under supervision for a specific period of time. For the first time on these plantations, because they had complete control of the population, they were experimenting with how to incentivize people. And that had no limit. So, you know, in a blacksmith shop, you might have an enslaved person be responsible, and these are hypothetical numbers, but you know, for 10 horseshoes a day, and they were paid monetary bonuses at the end for producing more than 10 horseshoes. This is exactly our management system, and this is the system that Frederick Winslow Taylor explicitly adopted, right? I mean, the very word task comes from slavery. A task master is the person who supervised the slaves. Now, there is a point to be made that of course, for as long as we have delegated positions and we've delegated work, you've had to supervise people. But the methods by which we supervise people have changed dramatically, right? And the technology has changed dramatically. And that needs to be a conversation that we have about the very dark history of a lot of these methods and and, and how we have amplified the technology such that that technology breaks down a lot of barriers that used to exist before and that were frankly in the United States protected under the 13th Amendment, which abolished slavery. So if you think about the conditions of slavery, and I want to be very clear here, I am not equating limitless worker surveillance directly with the much more terrible um, you know, infliction of harms that was the entire system of slavery, but it comes from that. And we have the historical record and the historical tie, and that sounds controversial and it isn't. Go look it up, it's not. Um, and if we know that, then we should be worried about these techniques. We should be worried about what they do and what they become. And so, um, we are breaking and, and, and the breaking down of certain barriers, which we have spent historical time building up to protect the autonomy of people, right? So if you're thinking about the time and place of the, the work day, right, you need to think about, you know, are, you're no longer checking in and checking out of the factory floor. If you're thinking about um, the, the extension, uh, the, the, so the boundaries of, of, of location have been broken. The boundaries of time have been broken when we're talking about the responsiveness continually to, to electronic devices and answering from your home and in other places. And then that last one that I really wanna to get to, which is the boundary of our definition of worker as worker, right? We, worker qua worker, right? The idea that you would only be interested in certain information about a worker. Why? Because it was pertinent to them in the workplace. By the time you're starting to look at my menstrual cycles, what business of that is the employer? 
I mean, there, there should be a yuck factor there, like an ick, you know? And, th and that's, what we're, that's where we're starting to go. Josephine, thank you. Thank you. I, I noticed you're very passionate about the issue. Um, but unfortunately, our, our, our clock is not, so we have to come to other, other voices as well. Um, Nino, yes, you raised your hand already. Um, any short comment on that? But First of all, I find uh, uh, I'm not a very diplomatic person, uh, and I have to say that I really like uh, what Josephine says, but what I, and all the things she's saying are super interesting for me. But what I take from her is that the technology is useful. The way it is used is not uh, is problematic. So do uh, so. What I'm, I'm I, I would take is okay. We have uh, surveillance technologies. Uh, we have to work very seriously to control what can be done and what should not be done. Not only on a legal standpoint, but in particular on an ethical standpoint. This is my take of your of your very interesting uh, uh, additional uh, uh, pitch. I, I would like to, yes, I, I would like to, to ask Julieta. Uh, Julieta, you listen to sort of two very different voices. And the question is, we know surveillance at the workplace is common. In, almost every company it happens. Uh, Josephine said that at least too much surveillance results in negative ethical consequences. How do you think from a practical point of view, a balance between surveillance and trust can be struck? Hi, Matthias. Thank you very much for your introduction. And I really want to thank Josephine and, and Nino uh, for their point of view. I think that they are really, really, really interesting. Um, but taking this to the ground and in a compliance position in a, in, a, in a really huge company working in compliance, I think that surveillance, I think that we don't leave surveillance as Josephine is describing, maybe not so the surveillance as surveillance, but of course that we have surveillance. Of course that all companies has surveillance on their employees, on their procedures, on their policies and everything. So uh, I think that in here, the, the important thing, and I agree with Nino, is how we handle this surveillance, how, how we handle these tools that we have. So from my point of view, um, we are humans, of course, and companies are made out of people. So at the end of the day, we have a lot of tools, we have a lot of information, we have a lot of data analytics, learning machines, and that kind of things that at the end of the day, I don't understand how to use them, <laughs> but we have a, a really big battery of information. So what, what are we going to do with that information? Um, we have tools, we have information, but behind all of that, there is people, there are people, and we need to trust them because as Lorenzo said at the beginning, we can put a lot of controls, we can put a lot of guidelines and everything, but if someone wants to behave in an, in a, with misconduct or in an incorrect way, it will be, I think that there is no control available that protect your company against the, 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 the really, from the opinion of that person. I think that we need to set controls and monitors and everything and guidelines and procedures just to set the tone of our company. But if we don't go to train uh, our people, we will have a problem at the end of the day. I think that the important thing is to train people, to inform them and to set the ground, just to explain them what are we expecting from them. Then of course that we have information, we have controls, we have surveillance tools that will allow us to set our risk and to, that, that, that will permit us to set our, our programs, a compliance program, a risk management program, an internal control program. Um, but I think that we need to use in that way. Of course, that we, if we have an investigation, we need to set uh, more robust controls and we need to develop a lot of surveillance tools 
uh, because we need to, to, to understand and to learn about which is the problem, which kind of misconduct had to place and everything. But in, the, in a day-to-day -day basis, I think that from a compliance perspective, from a compliance organization, we are not focused on surveillance on people. We are focused on see if our programs are accomplished. We are focused on protect our company and not to see if the people is complying with the procedures or not. Yes, with the procedures, yes, with the, with the guidelines, but not with what are they doing with, the, with their times and everything. Um, I think that, 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 that surveillance is a tool that we use and of course, there are some areas that need to put more surveillance than, than other areas. But from compliance, I think that surveillance is just the part of the, detect, the detection. And I think that the interesting part of a compliance organization is to work in the preventive par part. Then, of course, you need to detect if everything is go going okay or not. If, the, if your system are working, if you're training and working, and if you, at the end of the day, if you are protecting your company. But I think that we need to see the surveillance on, the, on that sense to protect the company. And all, of course, that always based on an ethic line. Uh, and we have laws, regulations. Uh, we need to sign a lot of papers when we join a company, giving our consent to, to, of our information and, and everything. But I think that the most important thing that surveillance areas and, and the ones who has this power and these functions of, of surveillance Needs to have in mind that that the privacy and the and the and your information is your information and is information from the our people. So I think that 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 if all the organization has the has in mind this uh, have in mind this in this kind of principle this kind of uh, principle uh, uh, on, on the information of our people, it will be working okay at least in the companies. Um, sorry, no. Okay. I am. An, I have one comment of half half minute, which is a, a platform like yours as a moral duty toward the society to control what's happening. After the Manchester attacks, there was a, a an, an investigative report by Channel Four demonstrating that all elements used by terrorists to prepare bombs were available in Amazon, in Amazon. So platform like yours have a moral duty to control not only internally, but also externally, because we are dealing about issues like national security. Completely agree with you. Completely agree Joseph, and, sorry. I, no, no, sorry, yeah, sorry, I interrupt I think you. That they're, oh, sorry, Julieta, go ahead. No, 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 go you, go you. Okay, um, I was merely going to say that um, I think, so So as a legal liability matter, I, I'm not sure I agree with Nino, actually, <laughs> in the sense of, you know, and, and here I look more conservative, I would say, um, but, but in the sense that I really agree with Julieta in that, um, you, surveillance is a tool, sure, as Nino is saying, but the issue is, is it being used as an excuse for poor management? Is that what that is, right? Because if it's a crutch for poor management, then you're gonna drive everybody out of the company and the best people out of the company. But you have to, and, and so Juliet is right, you have to set the tone, but you have to set the tone first, right? And the tone has to be self-implemented elsewhere. This is tone from the top. This is corporate culture. This is many other things that talk about what we do here as our group and what we don't do here as our group, right? These are the, this is the type of behavior we expect from you. These are the things that we want from you, right? Where is our common purpose? To what ends are you working, right? Everybody needs that. That has been the beginning of the corporation since they were corpora in Rome, right? They were, they were common burial societies to, to to gather, do something important beyond what any individual could accomplish. That's the beauty and the and the power of the corporate form. That's why we give limited liability. That's why we do all these other things in the law. But you need to set that tone, implement that tone, and keep that tone 
through human being and human actions. Yes, sometimes surveillance can be an early warning flag, but the in interventions always need to be human. The conversation with the employee needs to be human to reset what the expectations are and to keep people on board. And what you are seeing is especially, I'll use the, the example of Amazon because Nino brought it up. Um, Amazon, they're describing themselves and the experience of working at Amazon in the US, and I don't I don't know if this is in Latin America too, as being an ambot, like literally being used as a robot for your labor and having and not feeling as though you have any other value to the company beyond that, right? That leads to the feeling of alienation that leads to, um, you know, isolation that leads to sabotage. And that's what you're increasingly seeing. And that's why it's so dangerous because no system can really protect a company against someone inside the company who's smart, who's savvy, who knows how the whole thing works and is intent on sabotage, right? That's not, that, that's where your surveillance programs are beyond, you know, it's beyond. It's, it's that, that's what management needs to, to get involved with way, way early to keep that turn from happening. And that's really the condition inside a lot of companies that, that where this has gone so south. And I think that there's a place to pull back here. There's a place to say, you know what, don't keep going down this cycle. Reintroduce the human factor here in the sense of human compassion, human, we are social animals. You know, we literally have neurons that mirror each other in conversation. We are wired to be social in all kinds of ways. And when we don't feel as though we are uh, valued in a social group, we don't give the best of ourselves to that social group. And what companies are asking for is the best of their employees. And they need that. They need that to be able to function and perform the purposes, the higher purposes to which companies really do aspire and their workers should aspire. Josephine, I fully agree with what you said, uh, but uh, the comment about the responsibility of the company. I was not talking about the, the the legal liability, I was talking about a moral responsibility. Personally, if I have a platform and I don't have systems to control, if a terrorist is, is buying all the ingredients for a bomb, well, probably I'm an irresponsible platform. So I think that as a, a manager of a platform, I should have systems to control significant misbehavior. Julieta, we are uh, we we are fighting, and you are there, so kind with us. What do you think? Well, can I just say one thing? I would just say those are import export control rules, so that should be articulated already. That's not the platform's responsibility in the sense of setting that up. Those are, should be import export control rules. But if so, everything is inside, Josephine, if you buy all the elements that are produced within Pennsylvania. And you have an internet. I, I was buying it when I lived in Pennsylvania. I was buying everything. I don't remember the platform. There was this second stuff, uh, say, uh, this, uh, this platform with second hand everything. So I, I had this, everything in second hand, even my hairs. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, I, uh, but if you have the platform, you have, you have to control. Right, it's like uh, in Italy we have this platform to sell secondhand stuff, and there are. Uh, um, I I already denunciated people who is were doing illegal uh, financial services, uh, drug dealers, uh, uh, prostitu um, uh, uh, exploitation of prostitution, uh, and and the and the and the uh, owners of the platform. Oh, but we we manage the platform. We don't know what they are doing inside. <laughs> Okay, so I, at least this is my my moral perspective, uh, and uh, and uh, it's not right by definition, of course. By the way, we have it to Josephine. You should come to Europe and visit us, please. I would be delighted. We'll bring Julieta too. <laughs> Hello, Hi, Julieta. You invite me. <laughs> I'm the mix between the both of you, so invite me. I saw some hands raised but I can't see them now. If there's anybody who raised his hand, please give me, give me a notice on the chat because if not, you, you, you won't be able to have your mic activated. 
Hmm. Yeah. Nobody. Nobody. But I, I had questions still to, to Julieta. Because what, what we listened to from, from Josephine, especially as well from, from Nino, is a very, very high grade of surveillance. Do you observe surveillance to that extent and that technological sophistication in Latin America already, or are we a bit behind? I don't know if I am mute. I am not mute. I think that it depends more on the kind of company than in the location of the company. Um, for example, if we are talking about multinational companies, it, it doesn't have a, a lot of sense to see if we are sitting in Argentina, if we are sitting in Germany, if we are sitting in the US. I think that for multinational companies, this kind of, uh, of activities, the surveillance, the culture of the company, the procedures and everything is coming from HQ, so from the headquarters. So in general, for multinational companies, I don't see as much a difference uh, if it is in LATAM or if it's in the Europe, in Europe. Um, it depends on the global perspective of the company. But uh, coming to, to LATAM, I think that uh, we have a lot of small, small uh, our most part of the companies are smaller companies and medium-sized companies. And maybe we don't, maybe they don't have the, the tools, the technological tools to, to surveillance, to, to do surveillance, but, uh, but they maybe as the companies are, are smaller, they have a, like more contact with their employees. So um, maybe they, they practice like a kind of surveillance more directed, right? They know when the employees arrive to the office, when they leave the office, what are they doing? What are they, they looking if they are, watching Facebook or if they are working or not. So maybe they don't need so much technological tools to practice surveillance. So uh, I, I don't know, I, it's like a, it's a, maybe more like a philosophy, ah, sorry, philosophical oh. thing uh, than the location. I think that it depends on the kind of companies that we have. For example, in Argentina, that we have almost 70% of medium sized, uh, small and medium sized companies. I cannot say if they have technological tools or not, but on the other hand, I cannot say that, that they are not being surveillant uh, and that the, and the employees uh, are not being surveillance by the bosses or the owners of the, of the company. Um, so I think that that is the difference. I don't know exactly, I work in a really huge technological company uh, with a lot of information, of course, and with a lot of uh, tools of, uh, for surveillance. But uh, I think that in general, if we need to set this uh, in a LATAM level, we need to think on which kind of companies do we have in here, which are the, La the LATAM companies that we have. Uh, and of course, that we have the multinational companies too, but I think that the most representative thing uh, are the small and medium-sized companies. And this is like a kind of different culture and different access to the, to the technology. Okay, thank you so much, Julieta. Thank you very much, Josephine and, and Nino. That was really a great, great part of our conference and very, very interesting.